the story of the marshes, like the rest of Iraq, starts in the mountains of Kurdistan, where right now the snow is falling and the mountains are being capped with a beautiful virgin set of snow for this year. Come spring, this snow is going to melt and it starts flowing down the valleys leading to the Tigris and Euphrates and it will start carrying with it the silton clay that makes up the valley of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, the land between two, the, the two rivers, the land is in fact soil from the mountains of Kurdistan. Think about it. The link between Kurdistan and southern Iraq is a lot more than political boundaries. <laughs> the water of the mountains of Kurdistan wants to get to the Gulf, but it can't because Shat al-Arab flow capacity is little. And thus, southern Iraq becomes a natural retention basin for the water, creating a beautiful, wonderful sea of water filled with green reeds. And these green reeds come in in the spring. The water, the pulse of flood that comes in with the mountains, comes in from, from the mountains, comes in the spring, just in time for, this, for, the, for the reeds to come out of winter hibernation, just as the birds are migrating, just as the fish is spawning. And, and in the middle of these, of these beautiful wetlands, this, this wonderful wetland in the middle of the desert, live these people. They call them Mi'dan. Ana Mi'idu Taq. The Mi'dan are our link to history. The Mi'dan way of life is our link to the Sumerians. And I'll prove to you that. It's a unique way of life. It's a, a life that is made possible by the reeds. The clay tablet to the left, to the top left, shows you how they used to build their houses 3500 BC. That's 55,000 years ago. So, sorry, 5,500 years ago. And the, the area to the foreground is in fact a reed, a reed house, Mudif, that was built in 2003. Not a single ounce of cement, not a single piece of metal goes into the construction of these houses. The reed, it's nothing but reeds, reed bundles, bundled with reeds, covered with reeds, nothing but reeds. This reed is the center of life of the Marsh Arabs. The upper picture shows you the conditions of the marshes of 1973. Here is the Tigris, here is the Euphrates, here is Shat al-Arab, this is Hueza Marsh, this is the central marsh of Qurna Marsh, and this is Hammar Marsh. The red means very dense vegetation. The redder, the denser. And look at how vital life was. This is before any dams were built upstream. It was full of life. This is the engine of biodiversity in the middle of a barren desert. But by 1997, the wetland that used to exist is no longer a wetland. It is a barren desert, just like the area around it. Uh, uh, the lakes that were full of, of, of fish, the lakes that I used to visit as, as a young boy with my father, became salt encrusted deserts. Well, what happened? What happened was, in 1991, the Iraqi people rebelled against Saddam. And in three months, the rebels were crushed and they went inside the marshes, as they have done forever. So Saddam set about destroying the marshes, depriving his opposition of a place to live. At a time when Iraq was not allowed to, single, to sell a single drop of oil, the entire GDP of the nation went into the destruction of the marshes. Six major rivers were, were, were built, excavated out of nowhere to divert the water of the Tigris and Euphrates. The engineer in me is in awe. They say Iraqi engineers can do anything. Yes, yes, they can drain 15,000 square kilometers of 
wetlands. The, the, the United Nations Environmental Engineering Program called the draining of the marshes the worst engineered environmental disaster of the last century. Uh, this, this is, oops, sorry. This is the Mother of Battles River, and this is so-called Glory River. Anyway, the reason is he wanted to deprive the, uh, uh, the opposition of a place to, 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 to work in, and as a result, oops, what used to look like this in 1973 became this in 2003. Well, actually, it became this in 1997. I saw it in 2003. It was one thing watching satellite pictures and showing my former Eden becoming a dead desert. It's another thing seeing it up front and personal. Of course, that's not to say anything about what the people of the Marsh Arab have suffered themselves, the dislocation, the, the, the loss of way of life, and, and, and anyway, this is past. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before 2003, experts, so-called experts said, you know, Azam, you're dreaming. There is no way in hell this, this wetland can be restored. It's not possible. The seeds are dead. 12, 12 years of, of drought, there's nothing that's going to happen. It's going to take forever. Furthermore, the marsh Arabs that you speak about, they don't want to come back to the marshes. They have seen electricity. They want to, 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 to live in the cities. They have lost what it takes. To, to live in these wetlands. I am here to tell you that experts know nothing. I am here to tell you that nature is smarter and stronger than us. I am here to tell you that I did not have to fight to convince the marsh Arabs that restoring the marshes is in their interest. Ladies and gentlemen, Azam al did not restore the marshes. It's the marsh Arabs, the Mi'dan restored the marshes themselves. Why, why, why you ask? It's not because they love the birds or the reeds. They're not rehuggers like me. They're not kayakers. They restore the marshes because their dignity requires restoring the marshes. They restore the marshes because their life depends on the marshes. Instead of begging for daily work, they can fish all day. Instead of having to be hired out as manual laborers, and workers in somebody's field, they can cut reeds, feed it to their water buffalo, they can cut reeds and build their houses, they can cut reeds and move it into, ma into mats and sell it. It's about sustainable living. They teach us all, th all sorts of things in the United Nations about sustainable development and all of that. These gentlemen, the Marsh Arabs have achieved sustainable development and they have been developing this area and living in it for 7,000 years. They can teach us lessons. And when the water returns, the reed comes back. Don't let the expert tell you that the seeds are dead. You know what? All they had to do was return the water and allow the water to, to, to go back in. And the reed forest, within six months, came back to what I remember them as, a young boy. And of course, when the reeds come back, the water buffalo comes back. And they say a picture is worth a thousand, thousand words. This is a few ten thousands. And here's some more. This is in the middle of a desert. You know, they, they pay thousands of dollars to come see this. This is, this is a site that has not been shared by many of you. Anybody that was born in Iraq after 1975 has not seen the marshes, have not experienced the marshes the way we old people, old Mesopotamians have. And of course, the birds came back. This picture, when this picture was taken, uh, champagne bottles were being uncorked in BirdLife International. This is Marble Teal, Khleri. Hmm? Non, the, non, the non population, no, no, wait, wait, wait. The world non population at the time this picture was taken was 25,000. We counted 43,000 in this picture. Indeed, that's for nature. That's for nature. Nature is stronger than we give her credit for. And of course, when the imperial eagle shows up, that means that the biodiversity is doing well. That means all is well in the animal kingdom. So is this a story of happiness? 
Yeah, it's the start of happiness. Is it done? No. There is danger across the horizon. This is a hydrograph. This hydrograph shows you the water flow of the Euphrates since 1930. Remember, I was telling you about the flood every spring? This is the flood. This is the symphony. This is the, the drumbeat of Fakhri. Okay? Every year, it comes in and it drives, drives the biodiversity, driving the, 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 the new life into the marshes. Well, 1975, Kiban was built, and so was, so was Tabaka, and you could cross the Euphrates with your own uh, feet. But then it came back. Well, what happened here? <laughs> Turkey began building the Gap Project, dams upstream holding the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates. These dams, in an era of climate change and hydrocarbon and CO2 and everybody, everybody thinks that building dams is the solution to pollution. Well, no engineering project is full of positive results. Dams have an effect downstream. Dams cause the death of the flood. This flood, by the way, was the reason why agriculture was sustained in Iraq for 7,000 years, because every year the, new farm, the farms get, get covered with new silt and clay. We, don't, we did not need fertilizer in Iraq until 1975. Nature was its own fertilizer. So what do we do? Do we wait for the marshes to die? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to call, to issue a call for arms. But this time, it's not to go to war but it's to do a blue revolution. <laughs> if we don't do anything, ladies and gentlemen, to solve the problem of water, the marshes will survive. Fear not. Fear not. The marshes will survive. The problem is agriculture in the land where it was born is going to die. What do I mean by that? Reeds can live in salt water. Rice can't. If we don't do anything about the irrigation of the waters of the, of the farms upstream of us in Syria and Turkey, Iraq is going to lose its agricultural land to salination because we use Sumerian methods of irrigation, and which were fine as long as there were floods. But now that there are no floods, we are slowly losing agricultural production to salination. So we need to modernize irrigation, not only in Iraq, but in Iran, in Turkey, and Syria. All right? We have to stop using the Sumerian method of irrigation. We have to use drip irrigation. We have to use spray irrigation. We have to minimize the use of water so that the farmer in Syria does not return the saline water, in Mabzal, uh, uh, the, 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 drainage, the drainage water back into the Euphrates, causing the water to come into Iraq at higher than we can, we can, we can, we can drink it, at higher salinity than we can drink it. What I say is instead of buying 100 F-16s that we don't need, do we, are we going to go to war again? Are we going to have another, another one this area? Do we need F-16s for God's sake? I say no. What we need to do is build petrochemical plants, convert that gas that we're burning into lines and miles and miles and miles of pipes that we can give to the Iraqi farmer, and not only to the Iraqi farmer, to the Iranian farmer, to the Turkish farmer, to the Syrian farmer, and not because we love them, but because we love ourselves. What we want to do What we want to do is help them conserve water as we conserve water so that we, the water will stay pure and clean as it falls in the mountains of Kurdistan. This way, we can work across the border. We can, we can, instead of fighting across the border about whose land this is, we can work together on helping each other live better and live longer in this area. We have to work regionally. We have to stop fighting. We have to be friends. And the cooperate, cooperation across the border is the key to the future. And, and again, I stand here in front of you predicting that the marshes are going to survive regardless of what we do. What I want to do, however, is I want to have my children have the same experience in the marshes as I did with my father. And hopefully, their grandchildren will do. And I want your children to come to the marshes to see the link between today's Iraq 
and our cultural history that we have been talking about, about Mesopotamia, about, about, about the place where writing was born, about the place where the wheel was born, about where the, where the place where Abraham was born, about our common heritage. The protection of these marshes is not only the job of Iraqis for the future generation, but it is the, fu the, 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 the duty of the world to help us preserve this. And by working together across border, we can solve it. Do not let them tell you it's impossible. Everything is possible if there is a will. Thank you.